Uh, let me just say I'm, I'm really excited, as you'll see, about this book and the movie that I'll tell you about. And uh, it's going to be a <coughs> real breakthrough, I think, in interpretation of Ronald Reagan, of uh, what happened on the summit, and uh, how the Cold War ended. This is not my first book. Uh, in fact, I've written or co-authored five others. And for the last 15 years, people have asked me, are you going to write another book? And I've always said, you know, I've written five. That's good enough for Moses. It's going to be good <laughs> enough for me. And besides, with those five, I found that the rarest of copy was an unsigned copy of my book. <laughs> <laughs> there were virtually none of them. Uh, and an unsigned copy of any of the five with a receipt from a bookstore that you had bought the damn thing, that was very rare indeed. So uh, I think this is going to be different. I think this is different because of three things. What makes this so special? Number one is it's just a great story, and you'll get some of that tonight. There were ups and downs. There were emotional highs, emotional lows. There were surprises all weekend long, and surprises continued the next year and for years afterwards. I think of the Reykjavik Summit as a Agatha Christie story. There's an old house in the middle of nowhere in a desolate area with rain <coughs> beating on the window panes. Two characters spend a weekend in this house, in this desolate house, which is thought to be haunted <laughs> by everybody, and have, see and experience the most amazing things in the world. And then when the weekend ends, really people don't understand what happened that weekend. <laughs> so it's really a terrific, terrific story. And there, the more I saw, the luckier I was to be <laughs> investigating it. Number two out of the three reasons is that the characters are fabulous. Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev are two of the most interesting characters of the last century. They're two of the most important characters of the last century. And they're two of the most unusual characters of the last century. Neither of them was anywhere like the mold that they came out of. Reagan was a different kind of president did different things than any other president. Mikhail Gorbachev was absolutely unique in the history of the Soviet Union as general secretary. And they were just charismatic, special kind of people. And the two of them came along at the same time. They were, they were the two main characters of the Reykjavik. There were two main other supporting characters. One we'll talk about in a minute, which is Marshal Akramayov, a who no one in the room has ever heard of, five-star marshal, the last serving active military officer of the Soviet Union who fought in World War II, and chief of staff of the entire Soviet military force. Somebody far more important than the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on our side, somebody who we had no idea was coming to Reykjavik and surprised the pants off of us when he showed up and turned the thing around in a dramatic way, and then found that what he had turned around really wasn't what he wanted after all, <laughs> and ended his life very, very tragically years later when the Soviet Union ended itself. And the fourth character of this great, great story is, of course, the Hofty House. And I'm going to tell you about it. It's a little house. Uh, in the middle of nowhere in Iceland, which is a little country in the middle of nowhere. 240,000 people in Iceland at the time, 140,000 of them at Reykjavik. And all of a sudden, the world descends on them, and they really don't know what to do. We had planned the previous summit the year before for more than a six months, probably seven or eight months, we had planned out the summit. This summit was put together in 10 days' time. And it was thrown together. It was a come-as-you-are affair. And uh, it was wild, the whole thing. So I'm going to show you some scenes and some photos from this. As I mentioned, this is not the first summit that Gorbachev and Reagan had. First summit was one year before, in November of 1985. 
It was the first summit for Reagan. It was the first summit for Gorbachev. It was the first U.S.-Soviet summit in six and a half years. And the anticipation was high. I was working at the time as the Armed Control Director, and I had been in the post for a number of years. And all of us had great confidence in Ronald Reagan in terms of handling the political situation in the United States. But to tell you the truth, we were a little nervous about whether he could handle the situation at a superpower summit, okay? Because Reagan's reputation then was somebody who was very nice and congenial, but didn't know the issues very well, uh, at times was a little out of it, and, um, you know, was kind of a roly-poly uh, kind of guy who, um, you know, may be outmatched by Mikhail Gorbachev, who came like a storm. He was a generation younger than Reagan. He was supposedly so much smarter than Reagan and he was so much more knowledgeable. And so we were a little nervous, even though we were preparing for seven months, about the first summit. But then the most amazing thing happened to start the first summit. We were in this mansion of the Aga Khan that was a neutral location in a neutral city, Geneva, in a neutral country, Switzerland, for the summit. And we had worked this out very carefully so that it wasn't even in the U.S. or the uh, Soviet embassies at that. Everything was going to be neutral. We were in the Aga Khan's grand uh, hall, and I was with the group ta talking to the president, who seemed not to have a care in the world. A Secret Service man came up to him and said, Mikhail Gorbachev's limo is coming around the driveway. This was in November in Central Europe. It's cold, okay? Ronald Reagan heard that, charged out of the mansion to welcome Mikhail Gorbachev. And there is Reagan looking like a million dollars. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And there is Gorbachev coming out of this big car that looks like a gangster <laughs> from the 1930s with uh, head to foot swaddled in wool, wool everywhere. He looks like a gnarled little old man. And here's Ronald Reagan, 20 some years older than him. And then after greeting, and you'll see that, after greeting, Reagan points to the mansion like, come on, welcome. Gorbachev nods and thanks him like that is very nice for him to be welcoming him in. And then the most amazing part is, as they're walking up the stairs, Reagan, not to be showy or anything like that, just to be a little helpful, puts his arm under R Gorbachev's <laughs> arm, just in case he has a little trouble with those stairs on that. It was a scene that we looked at and said, okay, we're a fine now, all right? Here are just some of the, uh, <laughs> here is he <laughs> taking him up on that and uh, guiding him where, you know, just like, I'm so happy to have you as my guest. <laughs> I'm going to cut to a little uh, <laughs> clip for a minute of Don Regan, who was then Chief of Staff of the White House, who describes exactly this scene. And pay attention to what Regan says, but especially pay attention to what the Russian, this is the Russian spokesman, who I knew personally very well at the Geneva summit. See what he thought of this opening move. We were waiting for General Secretary Gorbachev to arrive. President Reagan uh, was waiting inside the mansion. He had no coat on. Uh, he was asked, did he want to put a coat on? And while he was trying to make up his mind, the Secret Service announced that Gorbachev was there. So Reagan said, my heavens. He raced out the door without his overcoat, down the steps, and just as Gorbachev's <laughs> limousine door opened, there was Reagan with his hand out, ready to greet him. Gorbachev was bundled up in a muffler, hat, overcoat. Reagan then put his hand under Gorbachev's <laughs> arm and assisted him up the stairs. I felt that uh, we lost the game <laughs> during this first movement. You can compare it with a chess game. We started with the wrong move. <laughs> 
<laughs> Isn't that great? And I, lo I love how uh, that Gorbachev then goes like this, you know, like paying, again, emphasizing that. So that was the summit before. It was a tightly wound summit. It was carefully prepared summit. Like I said, we had spent seven, seven months getting ready for it. And um, <clears throat> so things went along. Then in 1986, uh, there were various problems between the United States and the Soviet Union, as there were throughout the Cold War time. And <clears throat> we had made proposals. They had made proposals. And we were getting nowhere. Gorbachev was ever impatient. He suggested to Reagan in September that why don't we meet just the two of us and with our foreign minister and not a, not a big staff in some place. And I would suggest we meet in either Reykjavik, either Iceland or London. The reason is they're equal distance from Washington and Moscow. Reagan got this message. He thought, you know, if I go to London, I have to deal with the Queen, I have to deal with Maggie Thatcher, I got to deal with all these people. If I go to Iceland, I have to deal with nobody, to tell you the truth. There's no one there. So, uh, so he said, he wrote back right away, and all of us were just amazed that this was going to be happening in 10 days' time. <coughs> and what happened was that there was a preparatory meeting of, to get ready for the summit right after. And like everything about the summit, it was bloated. And soon, 55 members. These are the American representing various government agencies. These are the Russians for this guy's KGB uh, for the government agencies. And this up here, where all the cameras are, were uh, for the Iceland government and the Reykjavik government on what to handle on that. The Iceland government wanted the summit to take place in the downtown location that had been just refurbished for a conference. And uh, when they proposed that, the two uh, US and Soviets said, what else you got? And they said, well, there's this kind of house in the middle of nowhere. And these security guys said, in the middle of nowhere, that sounds good. You know, <laughs> We like middle of nowhere because uh, we can protect it better than that. So this was uh, just about a week before the summit. And here is a uh, cartoon where he says, well, Mick, I see you're all set for our low-key one-on-one summit, non-summit. <laughs> and it was billed as a non-summit. This was to get ready for a summit, OK? Here's Gorbachev and a string of his officials. <laughs> the fact is, this was going to be, as Gorbachev put in his letter, you and me, maybe our foreign ministers, no big staff. Gorbachev brought 300 people with him. <laughs> all had diplomatic passports. Some supposedly worked for the press, Izvestia and Pravda, and some were reporters and everything. And uh, we had very few, to tell you the truth, which was a godsend to those of us who were there. But uh, it was just totally, they, they flooded the place. Plus, Raisa Gorbachev came with Mikhail, and Nancy Reagan did not. She was, Nancy Reagan was a wonderful person, is a wonderful person, but uh, when she got unhappy, she was uh, not such a wonderful person, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Let me say as kindly as I can that she was displeased to find out that Raisa Gorbachev was going to be there, and she was not, all right? Uh, not that they had had any great relationship in Geneva the year before at the summit. Uh, they took an instantaneous dislike for one another, and someone asked, or could have asked afterwards, why did you take an instantaneous dislike to Raisa Gorbachev? And Nancy Reagan could have said, because it saves me time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, uh, they just didn't get along on anything. And uh, we'll see throughout this. It did not help that at Iceland, she was there, and Nancy Reagan was not there. And uh, she was. Fantastic. This was the role of a last lifetime, as I'll show you in a minute on this. What are, I'm going to keep going on the slides, and let's have this as the ground rules. If there's something that pops up right when I'm talking th about the subject, ask the question then. If it's a general subject about you know the whole summit and consequences, then save it till the end, and I'll 
have plenty of time at the end. But if some, something I'm talking about, you know, uh, <laughs> do and don't, don't be shy about it. All right. So the Soviets bring, are bringing uh, 300 people, and we have, um, I don't know how many security, but professionally we had in our group uh, probably 10, 12 who were uh, substantive, and then, you know, Secret Service and, and uh, <coughs> State Department communications and all that. Iceland was, <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Prime Minister of Iceland. <laughs> it's the damnedest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this is a place, 240,000 people, they are used to nothing new happening, okay? It's very interesting, the more I got into this, the more I understood it. Iceland language, and language kind of reveals culture. Iceland language is Danish, frozen for the last 1,200 years. So a Viking from 1,200 years ago, walking down the streets of Reykjavik, could understand everything that's going on. He'd be amazed at what's happening, but uh, everybody on the streets of Reykjavik were amazed what was happening too. So consequently, the news media descends on these people. They say to them, you know, the, all the news media, we'd like to interview the prime minister. And, you know, the prime minister's office says, you know, what time, what, when do you have available to interview? <laughs> Any time would be fine. And apparently Tom Brokaw said, you know, we, we can have a camera crew at 10.15 or something in the morning. And the prime minister said that would be fine. He takes his daily dip, but that's not to prevent him. So this is probably the only interview with a head of government done in his tidy whities <laughs> on national, <laughs> no, <laughs> on, uh, on national uh, television, at least in the United States on that. And there's, there's a very young and uh, vigorous uh, Tom Brokaw who actually said some very nice things about this book. He gave it a great blurb, and I was grateful to him for that. This is uh, a, in this book, I have about eight or nine cartoons. I'm going to show you most of them uh, because I love cartoons and political cartoons, and I wanted to have one of our friend Jeff McNally and one of our friend Mike Peters. This is one, Expectations, and you can see the press. Uh, the week before the summit starts, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, Eduard Shevardnadze is asked about the summit because that's the buzz. And he says, well, it's going to be a very low key affair and because that's what Gorbachev had been saying. And not many of the press are going to be interested in going. By the time the summit opens, 3,147 are officially accredited for the summit. Okay? They can't find rooms there. And they can't get anything <laughs> because Right before the summit was announced, the Secret Service took up lots of room and then the KGB rolled in and took up the rest of the rooms. It was kind of sad that the American ambassador was told the day after the summit was announced, which he didn't know anything about, and he was told, and he was a nice man, Nick Rui, who had served in various Republican administrations and given gobs of money to the Republican Party and loved deep sea fishing, which was a real requirement for the job uh, because <laughs> otherwise you kind of get bored out of your mind, to tell you the truth. Anyway, he was there and uh, the Secret Service told him that, uh, you know, this house is going to, his house, his residence, is going to be where the president stays. And he says, oh, I'd just be thrilled. And he says, well, thank you very much. But uh, secondly, I'd have to say that's not where you're staying. <laughs> he said kind of, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, they said, you know, the president and, uh, you know, there are three bedrooms in the place and his uh, secret service and uh, his physician and somebody else is staying in the house and you need to find somewhere else. By the time the ambassador knew about this, there were no rooms in the inn at all. So uh, the only thing that really has happened in U.S.-Iceland relations since the history of time uh, it was without the ambassador, the United States ambassador there. We never saw him over the weekend. And it was kind of sad. I got to know his widow afterwards. In fact, saw her on the 10th anniversary of the Reykjavik summit. But um, 
you know, it was a, it was a lousy way to treat Nick Rui, but so be it. Uh, this is, it became a great event, okay? <laughs> this, this is Miss World, who was on a Goodwill tour in Singapore. She was from Iceland, and she was called back on an emergency basis to be there. Every afternoon, she had press availability in the press center. Uh, she wore her Reagan Gorbachev t-shirt, and she ran around town looking fabulous on that. <laughs> so uh, that was part of it. This, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Hofti House, OK? Built in 1906, it was, it was unusual because it's beautiful. It's unusual because I think it's the only wooden structure in Iceland. It is unusual because of the symmetry. Uh, the architect is uh, just magnificent. Uh, the setting is fantastic on the uh, sea <coughs> right there. And um, it is unusual because it is said to be haunted. The British ambassador took it over in World War II. Winston Churchill stayed there. And after he met Roosevelt for the uh, in 1940, 40, yeah, and doing the uh, charter, the Atlantic Charter there, and then he came and stayed at the Hofti House. The American ambassador, uh, the British ambassador after that time, said he heard bumps in the night and things were happening. What was happening was either the spirit of a young virgin who had committed suicide on the location, or what was happening was the spirit of some Vikings whose fort on that location had burned down about 800 years before that time. Regardless, the ambassador, Greenfield, his name, couldn't understand wh what spirits were there, but he knew that they were there, okay? And he reported into London that the house was haunted and he had to get out of there before, you know, the ghost got him on that. Uh, and so the uh, Iceland government took over the house. It had a uh, parlor on that side that was actually our, the American parlor. The Russian parlor was over here. This was kind of a DMZ between the two. Uh, the little conference room, which I'll show you in a minute, was on this side, and a kind of dining room area on that side. And in the basement was the most amazing thing. Half the basement. It was an unfinished basement. Half the basement was filled to the sky with KGB communications gear, the, the kind that any uh, American agency would give millions of dollars to get a hold of uh, at that time. The other half of the basement was filled <laughs> to the sky with uh, American communications gear and intelligence gear. Uh, and the two of them shared the basement very nicely. There was only one problem. There was uh, two bathrooms, which was not a problem, but one was larger than the other. <laughs> and during the negotiations in that week before, both wanted to get the bigger loo. And the uh, caretaker for the Hofti House, who was not used to negotiating between the nuclear superpowers, uh, especially on anything as sensitive as privy pri privileges, uh, just tried to work it out until the KGB chief finally said, let's just, whatever happens that during the summit, let's have happen. So as I put in the book, uh, usually U.S. intelligence, or U.S., or excuse me, usually intelligence agencies around the world operate on a need-to-know basis. The two main intelligence agencies in the world that weekend operated on a need-to-go basis, <laughs> all right? That was another innovation of the Reykjavik summit. But you'll see the size of uh, the Hofti House is very small. It has now become a uh, symbol of uh, peace and love and understanding. And I got for Hanukkah this year a uh, much underappreciated gift, let me say, for the whole family, which is T-shirts of Reykjavik, the uh, world peace with the Hofti House. And you can imagine our daughters how thrilled they were to have a t-shirt like that and how very appreciative they were. Well, 
you can imagine their reaction anyway and uh, on that. But anyway, it has become a great symbol of uh, <laughs> peace and understanding because of the summit on that. Okay, this is uh, one of the cartoons, uh, and uh, it says basically, you know they say this house is haunted. There's this, the Hufty house. Uh, you want spooky, check out what's happening next door, and that was, of course, the arms race that was happening next door. All right. Uh, Raisa Gorbachev, I told you. She came to uh, Reykjavik, and um, it was the role of a la lifetime. It was the weekend of her lifetime. Unbeknownst to me, before re doing research, the role of first lady had never occurred to Karl Marx. Okay? <laughs> you might be surprised to hear that. It had really never occurred either to Lenin or to Stalin. All right? So until Raisa, or even later than the Reykjavik summit, the, there were no pictures of the First Lady in the Soviet press. When she was in a picture of her husband, it was either cropped out or fuzzed out, or she was unidentified. For most of the 70 years of the Soviet Union, the position of the wife of the general secretary was no one knew that there was a wife until the funeral of that general secretary. So Raisa was unknown in the Soviet Union at that time. On the plane coming over to Reykjavik, there was a long ceremony and one of these triple cheek kisses that Gorbachev bestowed on the Politburo, seeing him off for the summit in, uh, in Iceland. And meanwhile, Raisa goes in the back entrance of the plane on, uh, as was customary, so she wouldn't be seen in any of the ceremony on that. She, Gorbachev writes the Icelandic government and says she's very interested in seeing the sites of Reykjavik. Please give as many sites as you possibly can. She ends up, for those two days, doing a lot more than any sites anybody imagined in Reykjavik. She went around and for the first day, she changed her clothes four times to come for different outfits that she had brought. She used the gangplank of the boat they were staying on, and the boat was named after a singer that was called the Soviet Sinatra, <laughs> who, uh, it was the George Otis boat. He was a popular singer then uh, behind the Iron Curtain, and his theme song was The Impossible Dream which I thought was just perfect on that. <laughs> Who could make up this stuff? But they went and they decided, to, the Gorbachevs decided to stay on the boat. A reporter asked uh, Raisa, why are they staying on a boat rather than uh, in a hotel at Reykjavik? She says, because it's oh so romantic. <laughs> and uh, so it really was, uh, was fantastic, the role that she played on that weekend. Any questions so far? On her outfits or uh, anything like that, or anything? Yeah, she is attractive, yeah, and very stylish, yeah. And uh, anything? Okay, we'll move along. Don't be shy now. This I love. This is one of my favorite, my favorite photos. This is the day before the summit starts. This is the president and the president of Iceland who was the first elected female president in the world. She had majored in French and had run the local theater for the previous 15 years. <laughs> Reagan is fantastic. Look at that. He is wearing a Ulster jacket, fur line, from the 1930s. I presume he just took it off a movie set. Uh, <laughs> who wears a jacket like this? During that whole weekend, or his whole presidency, to tell you the truth, I never saw him in the jacket again. So he never wore it any other day of that. They had a walk around. Over here was the presidential house, like the White House, but the president is a symbol uh, there. And uh, head, of head of state, but not government. And she had a talk with Reagan as they went around, and she said to him, that we're both of the theater, both acting. She says, you know what, I, here's my thought. 
There's no school teaching you how to be a president. But theater is the best thing because they're discussing what life is about, what society is about all day long. Reagan loved that idea, and he called her my old colleague ever since that time. And whenever she appeared at any international meeting or anything like that, he says, there's my old colleague on that. So uh, I think it, it's a great, I love to see the two of them. I think the, the uh, layout of the picture, and especially what Ronald Reagan is wearing, is just fabulous. All right. This is the opening bell of the summit. It's on Saturday morning, October 11th, and, uh, 1986. And they are standing outside the Hofti House. Uh, Reagan did arrive first, but Gorbachev had the wit and wherewithal to uh, leave all the <coughs> uh, outer garments in the car or uh, on the boat where he was staying, so he would look as vigorous as Reagan on that. And <coughs> And so they are there for a photo. They have a photo op outside. Then the mayor of Reykjavik, who, you know, at a normal time would be lucky to come to a cocktail party where either of the two of them were at. This is a mayor of a town about the size of, I think it's uh, Duluth, Wisconsin, or something like that. Uh, and uh, he then directs the two of them to the second photo op. They just did a photo op outside for all 3,174 journalists. So then he puts them right here in inside, and he features, of course, he's being the mayor of Reykjavik. He features the flag of Reykjavik. And the flag of Reykjavik has two pillars that are what we would call staffs. And what the founder of Reykjavik had these staffs in his boat. He puts them out at sea, and he asks the gods, of which there are many in Iceland, many, many, many. And he asks the gods to direct him through those pillars, staffs, to fertile land. And either the gods had lost their sense of direction or found their sense of humor because he directed him, the founder, to probably the least fertile spot on earth, this side of the Sahel Desert, anyway. Because Reykjavik, I don't know, how many of you have been to Reykjavik? All right, it's all lava. And it's black lava everywhere, as far as the ice I can see. It has been used by um, the astronauts for training on uh, walking on the moon. Because, and the astronaut, one astronaut told Reagan, who told us afterwards, that, uh, <laughs> This looks a lot more like the moon than the moon does, all right? <laughs> so Reagan was trying to wrap his mind around that comment. But uh, anyway, so he wanted to feature his flag. He wanted to feature the sculptors of the uh, main sculptor in Iceland right there. But the fact is that the concentration of everybody was on the two heads, all right? Gorbachev, because of his birthmark, that became his trademark in the West, but it was not seen in the Soviet Union. It was either airbrushed out or the photographers were told to take them always from this side, what's that, the right side, so that you would not see it. So virtually no one in the Soviet Union knew he had that. That was caused by blood vessels very high to the surface. It's easily correctable by surgery in the West, but he did not want to go to the West for surgery, and obviously he didn't think that much of surgery in the Soviet Union, so that he wasn't going to endanger his head to somebody there <coughs> on it. <coughs> Reagan's head was just as fascinating. No one could believe a man of 75 could have hair that wavy, that dark, that beautiful, without a touch of... Uh, <coughs> gray or white. Personally, I have hair that much. I'd like that, but I dye my hair white so I can give presentations like that and uh, like this and be ta taken seriously. But uh, every week or so, the roots come in very, very dark like that. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that investigative, investigative journalists, once Reagan became president, rushed into the barbershop, or when he was governor even, rushed into the barbershop to scoop up strands of his hair to find the chemicals that he was using, and no one found any chemicals ever. 
It's just, yeah, and his brother, who uh, had hair just like that as well. And so I have the Mike, the Mike Peters cartoon, our dear friend who lives in Snowmass. <laughs> Mr. President, you really have Irish roots. No, actually, Grecian formula. <laughs> it was, uh, I think, the only unkind cartoon I put in there, but uh, I love Mike Peters, so I put it in there anyway. Okay, so here is the room where they met. It's on the side. It's a very small room. And they met for 10 and a half hours. I don't know if you have ever had a discussion for 10 and a half hours. No, you have? All right. <laughs> I've never had. And this was discussing the main issues of their era without really any staff, without any briefing papers, without any talking points or anything else. Now, you do have Secretary of State Schultz there and Foreign Minister Shevardnadze, okay? They were in the room except for the first hour, uh, the whole time of the 10 and a half hours. So they were there nine and a half out of the 10 and a half hours. 10 and a half, we were out of two days, uh, <coughs> Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, it was supposed to stop at Sunday noon, and it went into overtime on Sunday afternoon, something that no summit had ever done before, and uh, went on until about 4.30 or so. In this room, on that, during the 10 and a half hours, at no point, this is freaky. Does Ronald Reagan turn to Schultz and say, what do you think? Or can you give me information on that issue that Gorbachev has raised? At no point does Gorbachev ask Shevardnadze for either his advice or his clarification on that. They are all solo. Alan. Yes, they here. Thank you, Alan, for that. Here's what happened. It's Gorbachev, Reagan, Shevardnadze, Schultz. There is our interpreter, he is on Reagan's left side because Reagan's right ear is deaf. He doesn't hear. His right ear was deaf because of a pistol shot during a movie take. When he was in Hollywood, it was way too close to his ear. So he, at least we had planned that out so he could hear what was happening. Here is Gorbachev's uh, translator who's going to be talking to him. Here you can see the little, no, the little foot of the... Soviet note taker, and here over here, you can't see out of the picture, is Tom Simons, who was the American note taker, at least at the first session. The, what we have now and what makes this book so fabulous in terms of real insights into these men is the American notes and the Russian notes who, that basically agree most of the time. There are a few embarrassing things to Gorbachev that are taken out of the Russian notes, but um, I use mostly the uh, American notes 80% of the time. But you know what they said. It's not verbatim, but you get the idea by looking at them, what they said to each other in 10 and a half hours of conversation. And it's the most amazing back and forth. Before the Reykjavik summit, people thought, oh, Reagan is a generation older. He doesn't know the issues very well. The dean of insight into Washington um, uh, re remember his name one, one second, who was the most, one of the most respected men of the establishment, called Reagan at the time an amiable dunce, you know. And it was thought that, uh, Clark Clifford. And it was, and then everybody kind of nodded and said that, okay. And even to this day, you read articles, I've read a lot of books about that, said, you know, Reagan didn't have the intellectual heft that a president should have, and Gorbachev really, by all accounts, was a very, very smart guy. All that may be true, but that's not what comes across in the notes. In the notes, if you covered up who said what and it had A and B, you would see no intellectual difference, there is no knowledge difference, and what's most amazing about what happens in that little room over the weekend was that more than 10 times over the 10 and a half hours, Mikhail Gorbachev says to Reagan, I'm making all the concessions. You haven't given me anything yet. And you know what Reagan says during those 10 times? Nothing. He says absolutely nothing. 
he doesn't respond at all. He's probably sitting there thinking, what's so bad about that? <laughs> what's not to like about that? I knew I was a great negotiator. So the fact is, when I started on this movie project, we had a director a year ago or so, and Mike Newell, who had directed Four Weddings and a Funeral, and you know, had spent 10 days up at Reykjavik getting a site location, he called me up afterwards and he said, you know, I was brought up in the uh, kid in the 80s, and uh, we knew that Thatcher was evil, Gorbachev was dumb, uh, or Reagan was dumb, and you know, and we knew that. Uh, you worked for him. Did you find that? And I said, there's no intellectual difference. And the fact is that Gorbachev kept saying, you're making the, I'm making the concessions, you're doing nothing. So the summit ends with Gorbachev making enormous concessions that I'll walk you through. The United States not making much of any at all. And not only did Reagan take him to the cleaners, but Gorbachev left Reykjavik knowing that, Gorbachev, that Reagan had taken him to the cleaners. And he says this on the plane. We have notes from the uh, Russian note taker on the plane from Reykjavik to Moscow. Uh, Reagan, I mean, Gorbachev is saying that, boy, I made the concessions. Reagan gave us nothing on this weekend. All right, so this is the room. During the, after the first session of the morning, we were in the embassy in a bubble. A bubble is a room within the embassy that is uh, protected against all eavesdropping. It, it doesn't even touch the ground. They have some uh, bricks or something like that or rubber things. It is about this thick out of plastic. It's wrapped in like Reynolds wrap around it and it's impenetrable. We had a bubble in Geneva that would seat, uh, we had a conference table in our bubble, and when we were doing the negotiations, we'd have 25 people in the bubble, okay? At Reykjavik, nothing ever happens, and nothing classified ever happens. So it had the smallest bubble in the world, all right? It was four folding gray chairs on one side, four folding gray chairs on the other, cheap as money could buy, and it was there at Reykjavik, and it would be fastened from the outside in kind of a vault-like uh, <laughs> lever that someone on the outside would keep people in there, and they would have a little air conditioning on that. After the first session, Schultz, George Schultz right here, called us into the bubble, and so we were there. Schultz was kind of explaining what had happened and kind of droning on about that situation. We're all of us, and there are eight of us in the bubble for an eight-seater on these, and we're so tight in there that when somebody shifted their body, the other, you know, on that side would have to shift their body. We were kind of, you know, shoulder to shoulder and knee to knee on that, and it was really, really very tight. All of a sudden, we see the big vault after about 10 minutes of Schultz going on. The big vault opens up. Secret Service guy shouts in there, the President of the United States. So we do what everybody does when he hears that, stand up. So now the eight of us are belly to belly <laughs> on this. Reagan, who's not a very small man, brings his frame and as he's coming in says, I, you know, it would be smart to turn this into an aquarium sometime <laughs> and put some fish in there. It would be real nice for everybody. And so now we have a problem that we have eight chairs, seats, folding chairs, and uh, nine of us in there. And I'm not saying that uh, I was insignificant, but in that food chain, I was not at the top, all right? You had the President of the United States, you had the Secretary of State, you had the Chief of Staff of the White House, you had the National Security Advisor to the President, you know, and then there was me, okay? And so I thought, if I was going to stay in here, and by God, I was going to stay in here, I would have to do a quick move. So I stood up, I said, Mr. President, sit right here, 
he was very appreciative that I was giving up my seat, and I hit the ground on there and was down kneeling, and after a few minutes was basically resting against the presidential knees for the next <laughs> half hour or so. And uh, it was an unbelievable situation where the nine of us were in this eight-seater. Right after the Reykjavik summit, about six months later, Anglican TV in Britain did a reincarnation, reenactment of the Reykjavik summit, uh, and they called it Breakthrough at Reykjavik, and I'm going to show you just one scene of that movie. Bill? Can you see okay? Mikhail Gorbachev surprised the world when he proposed a preparatory summit meeting at Reykjavik with Ronald Reagan. Their talks launched the superpowers on a new path towards the first agreements ever to cut their stockpiles of nuclear weapons. What follows is a dramatization of the inside story of Reykjavik. All right, let's get into the bubble. control. I, I should respond on that. Mr. President, if you start with human rights, for sure you're going to end up with arms control. But if you start on arms control, you're going to stay on arms control, so human rights will get squeezed out. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ken. George, we can't have just one working party. We want a, a second group on, uh, on the other things, so human rights, Afghanistan, bilateral issues. I was, told, I was told later that that was the high point of the actor's career. <laughs> Poor guy. I mean, you know. All right. So that was, uh, that was in, the, in the bubble. That was the movie at the time. There is a movie in the works now, and it has long been in the works, on uh, the Reykjavik Summit. And uh, it was, came out of discussions that Mike Deaver and I had starting six years ago but accelerated about four or five years ago. Michael Douglas is dying to play Reagan, and he's all signed up. Christoph Waltz is eager to play Gorbachev. Ridley Scott is the overall producer of the movie. Uh, I am executive producer, which means next to nothing on that, I have been assured. Uh, when they asked me to be executive producer, because I told them a lot what happened at Reykjavik, uh, and they asked me to be executive producer. I said, now, if this is a function, I'm no good at this because I, I don't know how to make a movie. I hardly know how to watch a movie. I go to a movie when Carol drags me to a movie, but that's about it. And uh, I said, but if it's just a title, I'm your man. <laughs> and they said, oh, please, it's just a title, all right? So <laughs> please don't interfere. But anyway, they, uh, that is all lined up. We have uh, $16 million for the movie. We have, and now, as of four hours ago, uh, we are in pursuit of a good director. We had one director and another director. You know, the director hunt has been going on on that. All right. Uh, this is one of the lunches at Reykjavik. Uh, Reagan is taking a joke. Uh, and um, Schultz and uh, Poindexter are getting a paper ready. There's a young Ken Edelman, there's Max Campbellman and others. Raisa Madley was going around town, seeing, like I say, more than there were sights to see, uh, including bathers. And she greeted you know, these girls in bikinis in their <laughs> bathing with her uh, fur-clad arm on that, just looking for something to do around town and to show her new finery. Uh, then the discussion was largely on SDI. Was the, that was the Star Wars, and it was a research program in its infancy, but I'm telling you, Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan were the only two people on Earth 
to think it was gigantic. And not only gigantic, but real and change everything. This is a great cartoon from our friend Jeff McNally. Uh, and anyway, <clears throat> we don't think such a crazy thing could ever work. You got a light, sure, business, and he lights his cigarette, garbage off cigarette through SDI. And Reagan looks at us and he says, this Star Wars stuff drives him nuts. <laughs> and over the weekend, the Star Wars stuff really did drive him nuts. Here is Akram Mayoff, who I told you about. I love the look between the two of them. Here's the chief of staff of the Soviet Union. He is emerging at Reykjavik and really makes breakthrough arms control agreements with us. Uh, Gorbachev says, may I have this pre-dance? Because this was not a summit. This was getting ready for a summit. And shall we say to get a little acquainted before we actually dance, that would be delightful. We can pre-talk while we pre-dance. <laughs> actually, Gorbachev's plea during the weekend was, it takes two of us to tango. Uh, when are you going to start engaging and start giving me something to go back? Saturday night, they had a kind of peace rally uh, street festival. Uh, Joan Baez was, flew in to give singing. And uh, it was, you know, just a great event. Saturday night, we, as the arms control group, headed to the Hofti House at 8 o'clock at night. Uh, and it was beautiful. You can see this. And the Russian delegation, we were surprised, startled to see the Akramayov, chief of staff of the uh, armed forces, was the counterpoint on that. Uh, Paul Nitze of uh, Aspen uh, was on our side, the head of the team on that. And we started at 8 o'clock in the morning. We took a break at 3.15 in the morning because Akramayov said he wanted to brief the uh, general secretary, we got the hint and said, oh my gosh, we have to brief the president on that. No one wanted to wake the president up at 3.15 in the morning to tell him about all kinds of issues he had never heard about in his life. And uh, when we came back, uh, Akramayov made enormous concessions on the strategic weapons that would have made the Reykjavik summit historic in any event. Uh, and uh, Akramayev was not seen the rest of that weekend. He just was like one of the bumps in the night who kind of disappeared. I kept up with him over the years. I saw him in his office in the Kremlin in 1989. And in 1991, <clears throat> when the Soviet Union fell, uh, the week before it fell, Akramayev hung himself in his office from the chandelier he showed me when I was visiting his office left a suicide note that everything he ever stood for was now gone. This is Sunday afternoon. We are checking on a remodeled uh, agreement that we had. And here's Paul Nitze uh, trying to stay awake because he had done an all-nighter. We had negotiated from 8 o'clock, like I say, till 6.15 in the morning, 6.20 in the morning. And then we briefed the president in the bubble, bubble uh, at which I had a seat, thank God at uh, about 8.30 in the morning, telling him we had accomplished more that night than we had over the previous seven years on that. This is a uh, kind of little Jewish minion uh, <laughs> together when, uh, most amazing thing, because we had redrafted the paper on Sunday afternoon. Reagan had left to go downstairs to talk to Gorbachev, and after we said, good luck, good luck, he had come back. And we were wondering why. And he said, I just want to make sure from all of you that we're doing right by America and we don't get caught on this. It was a tremendous leadership moment on that. And he's kind of doing a check with everybody. Are you comfortable with this? The summit ended in a crash. Gorbachev wanted concessions on SDI. Reagan would not give him any concessions. We had made enormous progress on the nuclear issues. But on SDI, it had all hung up on that. <coughs> they are in the hall of the Hofti House right there. And then uh, Gorbachev walks Reagan to the car. Uh, Reagan is the maddest he's ever been in his presidency. And he puts in his, his uh, memoirs, this is the angriest day of my presidency. And you can see him. At the street, uh, Gorbachev says, I don't know what we could have done differently. And Reagan points his finger in his chest and said, well, you could have said yes, and then walks away. 
Uh, we saw him back at the ambassador's house, and Reagan couldn't even sit down. He was just furious. Schultz gave a press conference that was pretty much of a disaster. He looked like a disaster, and he said this has been a bust, which only added to the failure of Reykjavik. Reagan, meanwhile, went up to Keflavik, which was an American NATO base, and was very depressed and very mad till he got there. And then he saw these 3,000 troops and their families, and he lit up. He told the story that when he was uh, first elected president, he knew, because he had served in the <coughs> armed forces before, that in order to salute, you needed to be in uniform. So he asked the commandant of the Marines one time, right when he was president, uh, he said, you know, I know I'm not allowed to, to uh, salute because I'm not in uniform, but a commander in chief, would it be all right? Is there any regulation against it? And the commandant, according to the story Reagan told right there, said to him a very wise thing, he said, Mr. President, if you did, I don't think anybody would object. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there you are, and he lights up when he's telling the story. <clears throat> the reputation was that it sunk. Reagan tried to make, uh, we tried to give various explanations of it. The next year, Reagan gave his great speech, tear down this wall, and uh, that was a great, and then Nancy and... <laughs> <laughs> This, ladies and gentlemen, is at the welcoming ceremony. <laughs> Can you imagine what would happen if it wasn't a welcoming ceremony between this? <clears throat> when they came to Washington, they signed the INF agreement in the East Room of the White House. There's Paul Nitze. There's uh, Vice President Bush. There's Nancy and Raisa trying to talk to each other, Sharon Nazi, Schultz, and the President and Gorbachev. All this row is all Secret Service and KGB mingled with each other. There's Colin Powell, Paul Nitze, myself, uh, Max Campbellman, and others. They got a kick out of signing this. Uh, then <clears throat> SDI continued to be controversial. Reagan makes a speech in Moscow and comes and takes Moscow by storm. The next, uh, the next year, 1988, Reagan leaves office. Uh, <laughs> here is uh, Gorbachev with Honecker. Uh, the East German, and each German, he fell to the Freedom Forces right after this, a few weeks later. The wall fell. Here's um, Rostopovich, who just wanted to be there and played his cello and just came in unannounced and said, all I need is a chair and played his cello. And then the next month, Leonard Bernstein gave a great mass that uh, was absolutely riveting. Uh, to celebrate the fall of the wall. And then Ronald Reagan in 94 writes his letter, my fellow Americans, I have recently, and I love this letter, it's handwritten, he just took a piece of paper out of, the, uh, as, out of his desk. I have recently been told that I am one of the millions of Americans who will, be who will be afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. Upon hearing this news, Nancy and I had to decide whether private citizens, we would keep this private matter or whether we would make this known in a public way. And he says he decided to make it known. And then he says, in closing, let me thank you, the American people, for giving me the greatest honor of allowing me to serve as your president. When the Lord come, when the Lord calls me home, and then he has something that he wants out, uh, uh, wh where, whenever that may be, I will leave with the greatest love for this country of ours, and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Thank you, my friends. May God always bless you. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's just something he just did. It's not a staff driven. It's not anything. It's just pure Reagan. The Hofty House, 10 years later, I visited. I wrote a card to Reagan, although I didn't have his his letter, his uh, address or anything, he was, he was deep in Alzheimer's at that time, saying 10 years ago we were here in Reykjavik, I was so proud to serve you and you did such a superb job. And I told Nancy Reagan about it 10 years uh, on that anniversary of 96 and she and I started crying together. Then of course in 04, the darkness came and there was a beautiful ceremony in <coughs> the body taken up to the uh, hall 
of the Capitol Rotunda of the Capitol uh, along the route. I love this picture. There were all kinds of outpouring of thousands of citizens here, two firemen who were there with the uh, flag saluting as the, uh, <coughs> the uh, coffin goes by. Uh, this, I love this picture of uh, plant people filing by the coffin. Here is at the Reagan Library filing by the coffin. Here is the family where the flag was taken out. And Carol and I were lucky enough to go to the Reagan funeral at National Cathedral in Washington and were very, very moved by it. The day before was the most moving thing, however, and this is how I end the book, is <clears throat> that the day before, unbeknownst to anybody, unannounced, in comes Mikhail Gorbachev, landing at what was later called Ronald Reagan Washington National uh, Airport. He goes right to the Capitol. He goes inside those ropes that the honor guard, he's let inside the ropes. He stands there for a minute or so, just looking at it. Then he goes over and he starts patting the coffin and then he rubs the flag on the coffin of the 40th President of the United States. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. John, flip on the lights there. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How important is SDI today? How important is SDI today? It is very important because one of the thesis of this book is that the SDI pushed Gorbachev towards reforms. He was scared to death of it, and those reforms just brought down the Soviet Union. Yeah. If you ask me, Reykjavik and SDI uh, were, caused uh, the end of the Cold War, and this was the weekend that ended the Cold War. As a military program, it is far behind what Gorbachev and Reagan ever expected. It's still a good idea, but it hasn't gotten very far. Yep. Gorbachev, well, he, he was never deposed. He uh, resigned on Christmas Day in 91, and he wrote a letter, I now cease all activities as president of Russia. There were no activities as president of Russia then, because there was, uh, as president of the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union had, had dissolved. Russia actually legally, this is a fine point, but it's very interesting, Russia had seceded from the Soviet Union. Everybody had seceded from the Soviet Union. So it was like a rock band where all the members leave and everybody says, well, is the band still in existence? Well, I don't know, but there's no members. And so there was no members. And Gorbachev, uh, you know, resigned from that, handed over the nuclear weapons, uh, the responsibility for the most powerful weapons in the world to the person he thought was the least responsible person in the world, Boris Yeltsin, who had been his tormentor for the previous five years. Yeah. Michael. Okay. So you can have it recorded on Okay. Yeah. Michael? Do you speculate on what motivated Gorbachev in, in the discussions and to make all these concessions? Uh, yes. I believe that two things motivated him. I think over the weekend, both Reagan and Gorbachev were very surprised at how the other was anti nuclear. And I think they were very surprised how they themselves were anti-nuclear, that they really wanted a deep reduction in nuclear weapons in a very dramatic way. Uh, and secondly, I think that Gorbachev was willing to put all these concessions out for deep reductions in nuclear weapons, both the intermediate and strategic, now in order to kill SDI for later. And that was a deal that nobody could refuse. And then he learned that Reagan could refuse it. And it was a perfectly logical deal for Reagan to have accepted. And Gorbachev thought, it's worth it reducing all these nuclear weapons if we kill SDI. And Reagan just wouldn't go along with it. Consequently, Gorbachev goes back and within five weeks calls a Congress, party Congress, now par party conference. Party Congresses happen every five years. Party conferences happen like never. The last one had been by Stalin, and there had not been one after Stalin's death. And the party conference voted 
to have the Soviet Union open up, reform economically, perestroika, glasnost, and all these changes that made a mess of everything. And that mess of everything caused the states to secede and the Soviet Union to disband. Anybody else? Yeah, please. Don Donna? Well, you definitely use a lot of wit in your presentation. Is your book as funny as this? It's funnier. <laughs> it's it's funnier? funnier. I'll tell you why it's funnier, but thank you. That's not a setup question, but I, I'll reward you for it afterwards, Donna. Uh, it's funnier because there's so many odd things. I mean, I didn't have any idea that over 50% of Icelanders uh, believed in leprechauns and elves, <laughs> that there were protests outside of Keflavik, the NATO base that was tracking uh, by phantom jets uh, Soviet aircraft coming over the Arctic right there. Uh, I had no idea that the protesters in Iceland, un unlike the peace movement around the world that were protesting at that time, they were there not protesting the phantom jets, but the phantom jets taking off from Iceland because they endangered the we people flying around right outside. I never, I never suspected that Raisa Gorbachev would come banging in for two days, uh, changing her outfit four times a day, uh, and wearing, uh, you know, parading, going around, looking at things that didn't even exist, that didn't even interest anybody. She wanted on Sunday afternoon to visit a working sheep farm, okay? And uh, they got there, and the sheep are there, and they're eating, and, you know, and uh, everybody says, welcome, and you know, all right, uh, thank you. And it's very funny, the Icelandic tourist agency immediately announced visiting the working sheep farm was Raisa Gorbachev's idea. <laughs> you know, it did not originate here at all. Yeah. Here it comes. So they're fantastic things. And let me just say one other thing. When you see Reagan and Gorbachev up close, okay, we have a way to see Reagan in a way that I've never had an experience before, and I was with him in many meetings and over the years and everything like that. And you see these history books, Reagan signs this order, he does this, he gives this speech, but you don't see back and forth in such a way. I did because I was in those meetings, but, but here he is with Gorbachev talking about the most important issues of the world, and they have a back and forth, really, sometimes in sync, sometimes totally out of sync. And their styles are so different. Their mannerism is so different. Gorbachev was like an American CEO. He had an agenda. He wanted to get through the agenda. Reagan is like a Russian artist. <laughs> He's following his imagination here, there, and it's wherever it brings him. So you have these wonderful times where Gorbachev says, Mr. President, I don't understand why we can't do X, Y, and Z on intermediate missiles in Asia. Reagan's answer right then is, when I was a boy, long <laughs> before you were a boy, and he's off. He's, he's off. He's off the rails. He's off. He's talking about the Baruch plan. He's talking about the missile crisis. He's talking about... Uh, Soviet duplicity on this, he's talking about VOA, he's just off. He eventually comes back, all of his stories come to a point, okay? But they're almost like parables, and they're beautiful in that way. They're all too long-winded, and they're all too repetitious. And Gorbachev at one point says, you've said that ten times before. <laughs> and, and Reagan says, well, I still like it so much. <laughs> So you see these guys, and you get, you get a feel for Gorbachev that I never had. You get a feel for Reagan that you're right inside. And let me just say this. My editor, Adam Bellow, who was uh, Sal Bellow's son, and um, he came up with a brilliant idea, really brilliant. Because I had the American notes, and I had the Russian notes. So I had, as <clears throat> a historian would do, quotation marks. The president said X, Y, Z period, end quotation mark. The, uh, Gorbachev said, quotation mark, blah, blah, blah. He says, do this. Change it from third person to first person, from past tense to present tense. And just put in the explanation. You're taking all the points. Uh, you know, 90% of the words are the same, 
as in the American notes or the Russian notes, but you're making it, I did this, you did that, back and forth, present tense. It's fabulous. It's just a great innovation because what it does is put you right on that table between the two of them. And so you get to know Reagan in a way that I've never seen. I have a four shelves worth of Reagan books at the house here in Aspen, and uh, they don't reveal what he was really like. But here you get to feel 10 and a half hours of back and forth with no notes or anything like that. It's just fabulous. Just answer this one last question. Okay, one, one my last, really about, last. My question is about uh, your expectations. Well, as an arms negotiator, uh, you had certain expectations beforehand. Oh. To what extent were you surprised, delighted, uh, at the results. We were totally surprised. We had gotten briefings from the CIA, but I don't want to blame the CIA too much because we had gotten briefings from the CIA, the Russian ambassador, the Soviet ambassador in Washington, Dobrydin, the American ambassador in uh, Moscow, uh, Art Hartman, and it was clear. We knew what was going to happen, that Gorbachev was going to come to Reykjavik just for a photo op because he had trouble at home, to have the President of the United States there with him, shaking his hand, uh, and uh, kind of blah, blah, negotiating, would help his domestic standing. He was going to offer nothing new, nothing interesting, okay? That was what we knew going in. The first session, before we got into the bubble, there's Gorbachev, and he figuratively dumps his briefcase full of new proposals on that little conference table in Reykjavik. And so we go, in the bubble, holy cow, what is all this? And so that weekend just took off. That's when Reagan suggested we have arms negotiators, or arms control experts, talk at 8 o'clock, meet at 8 o'clock that night. We do the 8 o'clock till 6.20 in the morning, make breakthroughs. Reagan makes further breakthroughs the next morning, and we think this is accomplished. Like I told the president in the bubble on Sunday morning, this is, we have accomplished more in this night and it's, uh, this morning, then we have over seven years of continual negotiations in Geneva. And, but Gorbachev had that, Michael, your question, as kind of a lure to get at SDI, and Reagan just wouldn't go along with it. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Patrick. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. At times, but they were never, the people said they were friends, they were not friends.